Welcome back to SoundBytes Ultrasound Teaching Videos. My name is Dr. Phil Pereira, and in this video sequence entitled The Rush Exam Video Part 4, we're going to go further onto our exploration of the rapid ultrasound and shock in the critically ill patient ultrasound algorithm. In this video, we'll focus on Part 3, Evaluation of the Pipes. I'm also going to include evaluation for right ventricular dilatation, really part of Step 1, Evaluation of the Pump, that we did not go over earlier in the video sequence. Here in Table 1, we see the four classic types of shock and the ultrasound findings associated with each of these conditions. We've covered Step 1, evaluation of the pump, specifically looking for cardiac contractility and the presence of a pericardial effusion. Now, looking under the column of obstructive shock, we see two conditions that we haven't covered prior and that we'll go over in this video, specifically looking for right ventricular strain or cardiac thrombus that may signal a massive pulmonary embolus as the etiology for the patient's shock. Now let's skip down to part three, evaluation of the pipes, which will really be the main focus of this sequence. And here, under hypovolemic shock, we're going to assess both the thoracic and abdominal aorta for pathology, specifically dissection or aneurysm with rupture. Under obstructive shock, if we do see right ventricular thrombus or right ventricular strain, we may want to switch probes and look for the presence of a deep venous thrombosis to correlate or corroborate obstructive shock as the etiology for the patient's condition. Now let's learn how to analyze the relative cardiac chamber sizes as a means of determining right ventricular dilatation and the possibility of a thromboembolic cause for the patient's shock condition. The normal left ventricular to right ventricular size ratio should be 1 to 0.6 meaning that the left ventricle should generally be twice the size of the right ventricle. In cases of acute pulmonary strain, such as a massive pulmonary embolus, as seen in the small image to the upper left, the right ventricle will suddenly dilate and may be larger than the left ventricle, as seen in the image. In conditions of sudden right ventricular dilatation, the RV wall will generally be thin, measuring less than 5 millimeters and this needs to be differentiated from cases of chronic pulmonary artery hypertension or strain where the right ventricle will have time to dilate as well as hypertrophy and the wall will generally be thicker than five millimeters. Let's take a look at this video clip taken from a patient who presented to the ED with a blood pressure of 70 over palp and a history of a recent hip replacement one week prior. With a small indicator arrow I'm tracing the confines of the left ventricle Notice that the LV is relatively small in relation to the gigantic RV, and there I'm showing the confines of the RV with the indicator arrow. This would indicate a massive pulmonary embolism as a cause of the patient's shock and the need for acute therapy to correct this condition. To put that last video clip into reference, let's take a look at a normal parasternal long axis view of the heart. Here we see that the left ventricle is about twice the size of the right ventricle, which should be the normal relation between the two chambers. Notice in the last video, the relation was almost reversed. Here's another video clip taken from a hypotensive patient who had just gotten off a long plane flight. And what we see here is that the LV is very small in relation to the RV. And notice the deflection of the septum away from the RV with each heartbeat indicating relatively high pressures within the right ventricle. So this was an acute pulmonary embolus, and the treatment here was going to be fibrinolysis. We can now examine the heart in the parasternal short axis view by moving the probe 90 degrees clockwise. Now we see the heart in cross section, and notice that the chambers appear as cylinders end on. We can see the gigantic right ventricle to the top of the screen, and the much smaller left ventricle is traced by the small indicator arrow. Notice here that the septum is flattened and bows away from the right ventricle due to the relatively high pressures within the RV. The LV almost takes on the appearance of a D-shaped chamber due to the flattening of the septum and the high pressures within the right ventricle, a classic finding in a massive pulmonary embolus. As we had mentioned earlier, we need to differentiate right ventricular dilatation in acute causes such as a acute pulmonary embolus from a more chronic cause such as primary pulmonary hypertension. This was taken from a patient who had long-standing primary pulmonary hypertension and with the small indicator arrow I'm tracing the confines of the relatively large RV in relation to the LV and we can also see the thickening of the RV wall greater than 5 millimeters. This indicates 
a time for hypertrophy that would indicate more of a chronic condition. We can also see a compensatory hypertrophy of the papillary muscles within the right ventricle, tethering the valve, that is often seen with primary pulmonary hypertension. Now, swiveling the probe to a parasternal short axis view in the same patient, we also see the findings of the small LV in relation to the RV and the D-shaped chamber finding. But notice that looking at closer at the right ventricle, we can again see the hypertrophic wall greater than 5 millimeters, and again, the compensatory thickening of the papillary muscles within the right ventricle, often seen with primary pulmonary hypertension. This video clip was taken from a patient who presented to the emergency department with unexplained tachycardia associated with pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. This is a subxiphoid view of the heart, and looking within the right atrium, it looks like there's jelly beans bouncing around within the chamber. In actuality, this is thrombus moving around within the right atrium. Very, very concerning that this may pass out through the right ventricle into the pulmonary system and cause a massive pulmonary embolism. While this is an unusual finding to see clot within the heart, we may be able to see this as we look closer and closer at the heart in patients presenting with unexplained tachycardia and shock. This is an apical view from the same patient. Notice here we see the thrombus bouncing around in the right atrium. Notice that it actually passes out through the right ventricle, into the right ventricle, through the tricuspid valve, and then is pushed back into the right atrium. And this was a very interesting case in that this patient had relatively high pulmonary arterial pressures and a large amount of tricuspid regurgitation that pushed the thrombus back into the right atrium. Let's now move on to specifically look further at step three of the rapid ultrasound and shock exam, the evaluation of the pipes. While in this illustration it looks like there's many probes on the patient's body, let's sequentially break this down. Let's look first at probes positions A and B. Probe position A is a suprasternal notch view in which we may be able to get a look at the thoracic aorta and the actual arch of the aorta, looking specifically for aneurysm or dissection. Position B is a classic parasternal view in which we can also get a glimpse of the thoracic aorta, looking for dissection or aneurysm. Probes positions C and D are the classic probe positions for placement to look for evaluation of abdominal aortic aneurysm. We can also see an intimal flap at times that may signal a thoracic aortic dissection extending down into the abdomen. Now probes position E and F are the classic positions for the DVT exam and should be performed if the patient has right ventricular dilatation on bedside echo and one has a high suspicion for a thromboembolic cause of the patient's shock. In this video clip, we see a parasternal long axis view of the heart. Recall that we see the three chambers of the heart from this view, the left atrium, the left ventricle, and the right ventricle. We see the aortic valve and the left ventricular outflow tract to the right of the aortic valve. Notice in this video clip that this aortic root is relatively widened, and I'm tracing that with a small indicator arrow. Now a normal aortic root should measure no greater than 3.8 centimeters, and a widened aortic root is suspicious for thoracic aortic dissection or aneurysm. Here we're actually measuring the aortic root. Notice that it measures 4.74 centimeters. And we can see there that this patient has a thoracic aortic aneurysm. Now we may be able to see an intimal flap here within this region, which would indicate a dissection as the etiology for the patient's shock. In this video clip, taken from a patient with Marfan syndrome, and chest pain radiating to the back, we see a very widened aortic root taken from the parasternal long axis view. This would indicate the possibility of a Stanford class A aortic dissection as a cause of the patient's shock. Notice here the very, very widened aortic root and what looks like the possibility of an intimal flap. Now an intimal flap may not always be seen on transthoracic echo, but if one is very suspicious, one can pursue a transesophageal echo or a CT scan to further confirm this condition. This patient actually was confirmed to have a Stanford Class A aortic dissection requiring a stent. This image of the aortic arch was taken from the suprasternal notch view. In this view, the probe is placed directly into the suprasternal notch with a probe marker oriented over towards the patient's right side. 
In relatively thin patients, it can be possible to move the head to the side and to aim the probe down into the chest to get a view of the aortic arch. And here we can see the ascending aorta to the left, the descending aorta to the right, and the aortic arch right in the middle. Notice we also see some of the branching vessels coming off of the aortic arch. And this would be normal anatomy, not consistent with dissection. But occasionally we may be able to pick up an aortic dissection or aneurysm from the suprasternal notch view. This video clip represents the suprasternal notch view taken from the patient with Marfan syndrome discussed earlier in the video sequence. The first thing we notice right away is that this aortic arch is much more dilated than the normal anatomy shown prior. And with this small indicator arrow, I'm showing the confines of the aortic arch. Let's look closer within the aortic arch, and right away we can see what looks like an intimal flap moving around with each heartbeat. So this patient was diagnosed with a Stanford Class A aortic dissection, extending from the root through the arch and down into the descending aorta. The next step in the evaluation of the pipes is performed through looking at the abdominal aorta. The probe should be placed in position C and D as shown on the patient's abdomen, with the probe in a short axis configuration. Generally, we'll begin with the probe high at position C and move all the way down to D to fully examine the aorta. We're looking for an abdominal aortic aneurysm as signaled by a abdominal aorta greater than 3 centimeters in diameter. Now, most AAAs will be fusiform in nature and also infrarenal. Some may extend down into the iliac artery. A minority of AAAs will be saccular as shown in the image over to the right where we have a small protrusion of the wall out from the normal aorta. This video clip demonstrates a abdominal aortic aneurysm in a patient who presented to the emergency department with a hypotensive state and tachycardia. Here we see a very large abdominal aortic aneurysm in the short axis view. Notice here we see a large amount of thrombus along the walls of the aorta. And recall that when measuring for an abdominal aortic aneurysm, we need to measure the thrombus in addition to the lumen. That means we're going to measure from outer wall to outer wall, not just the inner walls of the lumen. And we can see the swirls of clot or pre-clot within the lumen of the AAA. Now to confirm that this is a AAA, we can further go ahead and put color power Doppler or color flow Doppler onto this area just to confirm that there's flow within the lumen and that this is indeed a vascular structure. We'll perform that in the next step here and by putting color power Doppler there, we can see that there, this is indeed a turbulent movement of blood within the large abdominal aortic aneurysm. So right away we have an etiology for the patient's shock, and this is a patient who needs to go directly to the operating room and bypass the CT scan in order to live. This video clip was taken from a patient who presented to the ED with hypotension accompanied by chest, back, and abdominal pain. Here we see a short axis view of the abdominal aorta. First with the indicator arrow, I'll trace out the spine, our landmark for the posterior aspect of the abdominal cavity. Anterior to that, we'll notice the abdominal aorta, and while it's not terribly large in size, we see a positive finding in the lumen, the presence of an intimal flap. To the right there is the true lumen, and to the left is the false lumen. So what we see here is a thoracic dissection that's extending down into the abdomen. This actually turned out to be a class A dissection that was extending from the root all the way down into the abdominal cavity. So occasionally we can actually pick up an aortic dissection on evaluation of the aorta on bedside ultrasound. Here's a long axis view of the same patient. Notice we have the probe marker, so that superior is to the left, inferior to the right. Again, we see the abdominal aorta stretch out as a tubular structure across the screen. And in the middle, we see the presence of an intimal flap moving around with each heartbeat. Again, pathognomonic for an aortic dissection. The next step in part three, evaluation of the pipes, once one has evaluated the major arterial circuit, i.e. the thoracic and abdominal aorta for pathology, is to examine the major venous circuit, i.e. probes position E and F, looking for pathology within the venous circuit, such as a massive DVT, that could be the cause of a thromboembolic etiology for shock. And now while not every patient will need this examination, I would go ahead and perform this exam in a patient with a high pretest probability for a thromboembolic cause of shock or right ventricular dilatation seen on bedside echo. This illustration shows the lower extremity venous anatomy. 
Recall that the common fem femoral vein bifurcates into the deep and superficial femoral veins. Now the superficial femoral vein is the one that continues on down the thigh and into the leg and in fact has been renamed the femoral vein of the thigh. It will continue on into the back of the knee to become the popliteal vein. Now we can perform a two-point compression examination looking for a DVT by placing the probe into the area of the small indicator arrow, scanning from the common femoral vein down to bifurcation into the femoral vein of the thigh and the deep femoral vein. We can then proceed all the way down to the popliteal vein, placing the probe posteriorly and compressing sequentially from high within the popliteal fossa down to the area of trifurcation into the three calf veins. Failure to compress would be indicative of a positive DVT. This video clip illustrates normal compression of the femoral vein. At this level, we see the common femoral vein and artery. We have the high frequency linear array probe placed in a side to side configuration with the probe marker laterally oriented or towards the left. Notice that the femoral vein towards the right or medial completely compresses with probe pressure, indicating the absence of a DVT. So this would be considered a completely normal DVT examination. And in fact, we can see a little bit of the saphenous vein coming off the top of the femoral vein. Now we can use Doppler to help us in identification of the femoral vessels. This would be a positive examination. We can see the femoral artery with pulsations laterally or towards the left. And towards the right or medial, we actually see the femoral vein and notice the swirls of fresh clot present within the vessel. Now recall that we must go ahead and compress the vessel to confirm a DVT, so that will be our next step. But here again we see absence of flow within the femoral vein which is completely clotted off by a DVT. Next we'll apply gentle probe pressure downwards with a high frequency linear array probe. Notice we see failure of compression of the femoral vein and with a small indicator arrow I'm tracing the confines of the femoral vein. Again, we can see the echogenic debris of the DVT. That's actually the saphenous coming off the top, also involved with this DVT. So a failure of compression of the femoral vein indicative of a positive DVT. And in the right clinical scenario, this could suggest a thromboembolic cause for the patient's shock, especially if the patient has right ventricular dilatation on bedside echo. Continuing downwards, we'll look at the popliteal vein. Now remember that the probe is placed posteriorly into the popliteal fossa for this exam and gentle probe pressure is applied. We can see that the artery is anterior to the vein and that the vein which is posteriorly located completely compresses. This would be a normal examination and we can see that the walls completely come together with probe pressure. This video clip illustrates a positive exam for a popliteal vein thrombosis. Recall again that the popliteal artery is located anterior to the vein and we can see here the popliteal vein with what looks like swirls of echogenic material. With a small indicator arrow, I'll show the confines of the popliteal vein and notice that with probe pressure that the vessel does not compress. And in fact, with a small indicator arrow there, I can see a calf vein that's coming off the popliteal vein that's also filled with debris or DVT. And we know that most DVTs occur within the calf and propagate upwards into the popliteal vein. Now let's put all the information we've learned in the various rush segments into one unified rush protocol to help us in determining the etiology for the patient's shock. Let's begin by looking at hypovolemic shock. In step one, evaluation of the pump, often the heart will be small in size and hypercontracting with the endocardial walls almost coming together during systole. On evaluation of the tank, the inferior vena cava may be small in size with a large percentage change during inspiration. The internal jugular veins may also be small in size with a low clo closing column within the neck. We may see the presence of peritoneal fluid or pleural fluid indicating a hole within the tank. In step three, evaluation of the pipes, one may see an abdominal aortic aneurysm which may be the cause of hemorrhagic shock causing the shock etiology in this patient. One may also see an intimal flap indicating aortic dissection, another cause of hemorrhagic shock within our patient. Moving on to the next category, cardiogenic shock, generally the heart will be dilated in size. With systolic dysfunction, the heart will be hypocontracting with a small percentage change from diastole through to systole. On evaluation of the tank, the inferior vena cava will often be large in size, greater than two centimeters, with a small percentage change during inspiration, 
the internal jugular vein will be distended as well with a high closing column within the neck. One may see on evaluation of the lung the positive lung rockets that we talked about or ultrasonic bee lines indicating pulmonary edema. Pleural effusion and ascites may also be seen as a sign of tank overload. On evaluation of the pipes, often this will be normal, although occasionally a DVT may be seen in this low flow state. An obstructive shock, of which the first is pericardial effusion with cardiac tamponade, will be looking specifically for a circumferential pericardial effusion with diastolic collapse of the right atrium and or right ventricle indicative of cardiac tamponade. And the other two types of obstructive shock, a massive PE or a tension pneumothorax, generally we will see a hypercontracting heart. And recall that in cases of a massive PE, we may see right ventricular dilatation, and we may at times actually see thrombus within the right atrium and or right ventricle. Moving on to the tank, the inferior vena cava is usually distended in obstructive shock with a low percentage change from expiration through to inspiration. The internal jugular vein will also be distended with a high closing column within the neck. Now, if the patient has a tension pneumothorax, we may be able to see absent lung sliding and the absence of vertical comet tails. Moving on to the evaluation of the pipes in obstructive shock, we may be able to pick up a positive DVT within the femoral or popliteal regions indicative of a thromboembolic etiology of the shock and a DVT that may have moved on into the heart and into the lungs to cause a massive PE. Last but not least, in distributive shock, of which sepsis will be the most common, in early septic shock, the heart is generally hypercontracting, with the endocardial walls almost touching during systole. Later in sepsis, the heart may fail and one can see a hypocontracting heart with a small percentage change from diastole through to systole. On evaluation of the tank in distributive shock, generally the IVC will be normal or small, less than 2 centimeters, with a high percentage change during inspiration. The internal jugular vein may also be normal or small with a low closing column within the neck. In cases of sepsis due to empyema, we may be able to pick up the presence of a septated or complicated pleural effusion. And in cases of peritonitis, usually due to spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in a liver patient, we may see the presence of peritoneal fluid or ascites. On the evaluation of the pipes and distributive shock, generally this part can be omitted as this usually will be normal. So in conclusion, the RUSH ultrasound protocol can quickly help us at the bedside stratify a patient into one of the four categories of shock and immediately start the correct therapy for the patient's shock state. Now continuing on, we can use the RUSH exam to monitor the patient's response to treatment over time. And this is very important in cases of hypovolemic shock or distributive shock where one can look with fluid loading at the response of the inferior vena cava and internal jugular veins. Hopefully, they should become more plump and less distensible with respirations as volume resuscitation continues. This means that the RUSH exam can first identify the patient's shock state, allowing for appropriate therapy, and also, very importantly, can allow us to evaluate the patient's response to therapy by looking at the response to fluid loading as we want to push up the central venous pressure in cases of hypovolemic and distributive shock states. So I'm glad you could join me for these SoundBites videos, and I look forward to seeing you in the future as SoundBites continues.